Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to tonight's MHPN webinar. Uh, I am actually not quite sure how many people are on tonight, but someone will probably magically tell me and I'll let you know. I'm confident that there's several hundred people from all over Australia and it's fantastic to have you here. Uh, we would like, MHPN would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands, seas and waterways across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay our respects to the elders, past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. I'm Mary Emilaeus and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. Um, my background is in general practice and uh, psychotherapy and now I'm also a psychiatry trainee in my final year of psychiatry training. Um, I would really like to welcome our panel tonight and you did receive people's bios beforehand. Um, so what, rather than going over them all, um, I would just like to ask each of our, our panellists just a little question. Um, just for us to kind of get to know them a bit before we get started. So first of all, Monica, I'd like to welcome you. So you're a GP and I, you could let us know where you are and what sparked your interest in this topic of adjustment disorder. Mm. Um, good night, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to, to be on this panel um, and this discussion because I feel quite strongly about it. And Mary, like you, I'm a GP, um, and although I'm not a psychiatrist or a registrar, I have gone into psychotherapy as my special interest, but had over 20 years of work as a GP. And I was talking to my friend um, Julianne White um, about uh, transitions in our lives, and we were discussing how in general practice we often diagnose depression when really we should be diagnosing adjustment disorder. It was a fascinating discussion where she was talking about grief and, um, and it's really made me think about it quite deeply and so that's why I'd like to, you know, hear what everybody else has to say and, and have a chat about this tonight. Thanks Monica. And you're in Sydney, aren't you? Yes, yes, I'm in Sydney <laughs> yeah. and I work in Sutherland. Welcome, it's great to have you. Thanks. Um, now, Maria, I wonder if you could let us know where you are and also in your practice, for which type of client referrals would you be considering adjustment disorder as a potential viable diagnosis relative to mood disorders, including depression? Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for that introduction, uh, Mary. Um, I'm based in Sydney as well. Um, and my background is I'm an endorsed clinical psychologist as well as an academic at Macquarie University. Um, in terms of the question asked in, uh, with uh, clients that I see, I'd be very careful to screen for adjustment disorder when clients talk about stress-related conditions, including any trauma, particularly if it's early onset and it's not complex, um, and particularly with the changes with DSM-5. I have had referrals where uh, they were misdiagnosed, received a different treatment and then someone picked it up later on through the mental health system that they may be benefiting more from a stress related type of paradigm due to adjustment. Thank you and welcome Maria. And Curtis, you're a psychiatrist and I believe that like me you might be in Queensland. Uh, and what, <laughs> what would be a couple of points that distinguish normal adjustment from adjustment, adjustment disorder? Yeah, that's one of the key issues, I think, actually, Mary. It's an excellent question. Probably one of the first things um, all of us dealing with uh, patients with possible adjustment disorder need to consider. But at the end of the day, there's really two things that one would look for. One is whether or not the symptoms of the adjustment disorder which are usually depression, anxiety, stress related and maybe associated behavioural or sometimes somatic difficulties are sort of in excess of what you might expect for the nature of the stressor. And the other is whether a person might be sort of struggling with some functional impairment uh, in association with what's happened. And that uh, could be across any of the typical domains of function. doesn't have to be severe. Not all adjustment disorder is severe. Some's mild. But, um, uh, you know, 
either vocational or non-vocational impairment. That's what I would look for. Thank you, and it's great to have you on the panel as well. The way this is going to work tonight is that each of our panellists is going to give a short presentation in response to the case from their um, perspective of the discipline that they come from. And then we're going to have a um, question and answer discussion between the panel. We've also, um, I've reviewed all the questions that you submitted before uh, at your registration. Now, I can promise you this is going to go really quickly and I, I know that there'll be people who are disappointed that their question submitted at registration doesn't get asked, but I would like to reassure you that a lot of the things you asked will be addressed in um, the presentations and discussion. So I think it's going to be a really um, great evening. Just to quickly go over the learning outcomes, we're going to be looking at um, the symptoms of adjustment disorder, um, looking at the association's comorbidities and patterns of treatment seeking behaviour. So what kind of people come to see us about this? Um, describing tips and strategies to help improve the mental health and well-being of people with adjustment disorder, which is what we're all here for. And um, then also to look at collaboration and appropriate referrals. Now, you have also received the case study before we start. So again, I'm not going to go over it again. Um, you can see it in the resources if you want to reread it. And, um, but just to remind you, this is a story about a woman called Melissa who has recently separated from her husband and has a number of things going on. Now, she first of all goes to visit her general practitioner. And so I'm going to invite Monica to respond um, to Melissa um, the ways that you would think about um, addressing her issues when she comes to see you. Thanks, Monica. Thank you, Mary. So yeah, so so as a GP, we see a lot of people with with depression in the room. You know, they have that sense of despair, that that loss of hope, and um, you know, we can really feel it. And there's an automatic response to say, "Oh, well, this is depression," and you know, let's treat it as depression. Um, but I think that curiosity that we have and that ability to see people over and over again and have a relationship with them um, as a GP allows us to know that patient and perhaps that this is a fleeting mood rather than a true depression. And so, you know, treating the whole person, the physical and mental um, aspects allows us to also know, you know, their connections, their social support. So, you know, we know that Melissa has a mum who's recommended her, um, you know, to come and seek some help with her sleep. And so we might already know some of her strengths, her resources, the people around her, but also um, the sorts of issues that she's had to deal with, um, which are documented in the um, the case notes. And so if I was thinking of, of um, you know, initially depression, I'd be thinking of you know the early morning wakening and and uh, and the sense of not having any joy at all and so I'd be asking her about what is her sleep about uh, problems about you know because she's come for sleep problems I'd be asking whether she has you know sort of guilt and blame that is out of proportion to the situation itself um, and I'd be curious about her concentration at work and whether the conflict with the co-worker is related to a personality clash or whether it's in fact she's finding it difficult to concentrate. All of these things would be information that would be very um, important to make that diagnosis about how I treat um, when she comes. And the, the good thing about having a depression diagnosis for some people is that it gives them a sense of relief where they go, oh yes, you know, there's depression in my family. Often the medication that a family member's taken is appropriate for another family member, you know, like themselves. Um, and they feel like it's an illness, it's got a recurrent bouts like asthma, but they can feel safe that, you know, they, they've had it before, they can get better again. The thing about depression though as a GP that I used to find is that if you diagnose someone with depression, sometimes they, you know, rather than seeing it as, oh, well, it's being destigmatized, you know, I don't have to be worried about it. They give up on trying to do anything about the circumstances. They lose that sense of agency and that's not quite so helpful. Um, so I wanted to sort of see it more from the lens of uh, you know, adjustment disorder, could that be more what it's about? Yes, if it's depression, it's important to diagnose it because, you know, the treatment um, management is slightly different. But, um, but yeah, so could I have the next sl slide, please? And we'll talk about uh, adjustment disorder from my perspective. Whoops. 
<laughs> yes. So one of the things I find is that, you know, adjustment disorder really is that. It's it's this ability that people have, you know, some people have this ability to listen to their emotions, work themselves out, connect to their resources and just, you know, whatever that transition might be. You know, the conversations Julianne and I were having on the podcast were about, you know, having a baby or getting older or, you know, all of these transitions. But if we find that we don't have the skills or the resources then that's when we have all of these emotions and those of you who've watched the movie Inside Out will recognize the, the little characters for the emotions and so that's in a way how as a GP I could kind of go well this person's so distressed and you know to me that signifies that they're just struggling and they're struggling with the situation and so for Melissa she's struggling with the situation on multiple levels she's struggling with the end of her relationship she's struggling with the financial problems she's struggling with the loss of her um, friendship network um, and you know conflict at work there are lots of sort of areas where she's struggling and I'm sure she doesn't know where to start and so as a GP, you know, one of the things Julianne and I were talking about was the ability to, that we have to acknowledge the grief of all these losses and all these changes and to kind of go, yeah, it's really hard. It's really difficult. But, uh, you know, th this thing about not calling it a, a disorder, if we just say this person's having real struggles adjusting to all these changes and that's the time when um, you know a referral to a group if she doesn't have the resources to go and see a clinician privately or you know and there are lots of groups and supports that that we can refer to um, or you know just coming back for regular visits as a GP and and having that safe space and even just asking her what troubles her the most I'm one of the women that I spoke to who was in a similar situation said that the thing was was really troubling her was having an STD and being able to do that STD screen and settle her mind. So really asking her what would make the greatest difference. And uh, so if we if we do that and we also give a timeline to it, you know, that once they solve their problems or, you know, um, develop the strategies and the skills and, and start things that they'll be able to overcome it. Um, so next slide please. So that's why as a GP I sort of think, you know, should we call it a pathology like a disorder? Should we talk about it as a life transition? You know, sometimes in medicine we tend to medicalize things and pathologize things. Um, but I often think about you know, this old gentleman on the slide, Rabbi Tversky, he talks about this lobster metaphor of being a lobster where the lobster, when it's a baby, has to out, it outgrows its shells and so it has to shed its shell, hide under a rock, it's vulnerable, it's painful, and then it grows that shell again. So sometimes we can see that, you know, during this shell growing phase, things are going to be hard, but you can have the support that you need. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, my, my last photo is, you know, playgroup is not, uh, it's not for the kids, it's for the parents. So having walking groups, having, you know, any sort of group that will help Melissa to see things from a different perspective. And she might actually have good friends um, who are not in this friendship group who might be able to help her. So next slide, please. So when I'm thinking about, you know, the, the uh, framework in which I, uh, think about how to treat and, and how to talk to Melissa about the issues. I think about things that happen outside of her that she's got no control. Other people, again, she's not no control. And the only thing she's got some control over and influence is, is what she does for herself. And so myself as a GP as well, I'm wondering, you know, could the divorce in her childhood be playing into how she responds at the moment? Um, you know, sometimes we as GPs see people who also have had other things happen in their lives or their brain wiring is different, they have a personality disorder, that needs to be taken into account as well. And of course, all the comorbidities, you know, the alcohol use and, um, you know, avoidance of certain things. So all of these things need to be, you know, and as a GP, you know, we would sort of be asking about all these things. So last slide, please. So I think well-managed adjustment, you know, when we acknowledge as GPs it's hard, when we grieve the losses together, that even though it's a really adverse environment, like those flowers growing in a, an unseasonal snowstorm, that 
through this process, that's how we get self-knowledge and growth. And so that's what I would be talking to Melissa about and hopefully we'd be working on it together. So as a GP, that's how I would approach it. So thank you. Thanks, Monica. And just I'm going to invite Maria in just a moment, but I would like to just say that there are around, there's over 1,500 people participating tonight, so it's great to have everybody. Uh, so Maria, from a psychologist perspective, thank you. Thank you, Mary, and thank you, Monica. Um, so I would be referred such a case typically through a mental health plan via GPs um, or psychiatrists. Um, starting out, I'd have uh, some referral information, but usually it's not extensive. And in keeping with a case formulation approach that I use in the initial assessment, I'd be looking at the key features that the client would present with. Um, and in this case, what we know from uh, the Melissa case and some of the key issues that even Monica raised is that she's experienced a number of significant stresses in her life in the last eight months. The most significant being the separation from her husband and having um, and due to having an affair with a best friend, which would sort of be a, a, what I would consider a double whammy for the, for the client. Uh, accompanying that, there's a whole cascade of stresses that have um, resulted in the separation, including the financial pressure, which can really put um, clients under a lot more mental health strain. Um, including um, falling into arrears with her children's educational bills. Um, as a result, there's also the pending sale of the family home and there's uncertainty about where she will live. And obviously if there's displacement with any close neighbours that she's had and enjoying the neighbourhood where she was located during her marital life. And in terms of what we know from the psychosocial literature, our social supports, the quality of social supports are vital in terms of maintaining and enhancing wellbeing. And for the separation, uh, the reasons uh, stemming from the separation of a husband with um, a close friend, that would also um, create some so social awkwardness in her friendship circles. And hopefully Melissa would have um, an extended social network or close um, relatives and other um, colleagues at work that she could talk to. In terms of looking then at symptom presentation, um, from what we know from the vignette, she's got a whole cascade of symptoms that look like um, potentially adjustment and we'd have to also carefully consider the depression um, as well because it would determine the treatment plan and also the, um, the, the level of intensity of a psychotherapy um, if referred to a psychologist. So the symptoms she's displayed so far is low mood, the fatigue both mentally and physically, the loss of interest, the withdrawal behaviour, the loneliness, uh, sleep disturbances as uh, Monica had raised, the guilt and the uh, particularly around her children um, and also she's experiencing frequent crying and a loss of pleasure. Next slide, please. So looking at diagnostic uh, considerations, there are two key uh, diagnostic considerations here. Um, it would be adjustment disorder, but with the qualifier of depressed mood, because she does, have, um, she does elicit depressed mood at the referral, um, and comparing that to major depressive disorder, um, particularly in terms of a specific episode, whether it's acute and then also screening of the chronicity around it. Uh, just a quick summation here is that um, both these disorders have common trigger points and in this instance it's significant life stresses. So what uh, Melissa has undergone is uh, would qualify for either of these disorders. Now uh, on the left hand column is just a summation of the adjustment disorder uh, diagnosis according to DSM-5 current criteria. So criterion A is if the client uh, elicits emotional and or behavioural symptoms due to an identifiable stressor occurring within three months of the stressor onset. And in this instance, it seems that uh, Melissa does. In addition to that, there's criterion B for clients to meet one or both of these symptoms, which is marked distress as well as significant impairment in functioning. And there is some evidence potentially there that Mon uh, Monica also talked about with her occupation and impact on concentration, as well as her withdrawal from social activities as well. Criterion C is critical in terms of the differential diagnostic considerations, comparing this to adjustment and or depression and any other disorder. 
um, because according to adjustment disorder with DSM criteria, the stress symptoms do, um, are not resulting are not a result of any other disorder or an exacerbation of a pre-existing disorder. So that's quite critical as well. Um, and then uh, criterion D, it's not due to um, normal bereavement, um, even though there is a grieving process as a result of a separation from a partner. Criterion E is about the duration. Um, once the stressor or its consequences have elapsed, the symptoms do not persist for greater than six months. But for Mary, there's a lot of, uh, sorry, for Melissa, there is a lot of ongoing uh, um, a cascade of stresses, including her financial pressures and then the relocation of the family home. Um, and uh, as it stands, um, the depressive qualifier, there's other specifiers as well for adjustment disorder. There is the anxiety specifiers as well. But for this case, I think the depressed mood specifier is the one that I'd closely consider. Contrasting that to major depressive disorder criteria, um, the criterion A is the one that is, um, defines the constellation of symptoms for major depressive disorder episodes, that is for clients to meet at least five of nine, and of which uh, clients have to meet at least one of the top two listed here, depressed mood and or loss of interest or pleasure for at least most of the days over a two week period. And then there's the other seven criteria that are listed on this slide. Similar to adjustment disorder, criterion uh, B is significant distress or impairment in functioning. Um, and C is it's not due to substance use or medical conditions. And we don't have evidence of that for the Melissa case at this stage. Um, there's another ruling out in criteria D. It's not due to a psychosis or a schizophrenia episode. And E is another rule out. It's not also due to um, a hypomanic or a mania episode. And again, we don't have evidence of that for Melissa. Uh, the specifiers for depression is in severity and recurrence. And that's something to screen for in a more comprehensive clinical interview. Next slide, please. So this is a duplicate of the previous slide, but what I've highlighted here in purple uh, colouring is what, uh, what we know so, so, so far from the Melissa case. Uh, she does meet all the criteria for adjustment disorder, but the key differential diagnostic issue for me is criterion C, because if she meets criteria for another disorder, then um, adjustment disorder can't be met. Um, why this is important um, from a psychological perspective in a treatment formulation plan, but we're not hooked, um, fixated on diagnosis per se, but it's our, what I uh, refer to as our GPS navigator in terms of finding um, an evidence-based treatment program for our clients. Um, so with, the, uh, with Melissa, she actually does meet criterion A um, from what limited information we do have, including the essential uh, first two symptoms. Um, she meets criterion B and from the lack of information about substances, I would be inclined to say she's potentially meeting criterion C. Um, in terms of the severity, we don't know, and this would be screened through an initial assessment and backed up by a validated self-report instrument that would, if she agrees to psychotherapy treatment, would be used to monitor treatment progress as well, such as the um, PHQ9 uh, or the depression subscale from the DAS21 um, or uh, the BDI2, depending on what people use in their practices. Next slide, please. Further considerations I would factor in, in terms of an assessment treatment formulation is uh, Melissa's psychiatric history. We do not really know much about her mental health in the past, and that's important to factor in, particularly her experiences with mental health and allied health services, because it will give us an indicator of engagement uh, and whether this is a right fit for her at this time. And also if she has had access to treatments even limited, whether what was the outcomes and whether what she liked and what she didn't like. Given there is mood impairment, irrespective of whether you opt for the uh, adjustment disorder or MDD, we need to screen for suicidal risk um, in terms of safety and duty of care issues and social supports to get her through this crisis point and between therapy sessions. And, and not only access to the social supports that I raised earlier on, 
but Melissa's willingness to actually reach out for help, uh, particularly uh, during times when um, she may be plagued by um, upsetting thoughts and, and really feeling out of control. Moreover, I would also be checking in uh, with Melissa and any client in this circumstance about her willingness to engage in psychotherapy if I was to recommend it, because we do really need informed consent from our clients. Um, and we know from the evidence base um, from uh, the therapeutic paradigms that I work with um, that uh, clients' motivation and engagement is vital to treatment success as well. With that in mind, although um, if she was referred under a mental health care plan, even though Medicare covers some of the sessions depending on who she sees, including um, how where I work, uh, there is a gap coverage for our clients and we have to factor in financial constraints and this is very relevant for Melissa given the financial pressures because if she can't afford treatment then we'd have to uh, refer on to a provider that can actually, may not have that gap coverage. And similar to what uh, Monica has raised, I always look out for clients' strengths and resources to fit into the treatment formulation. And one a strength is actually for clients uh, actually asking for help. That's a strength to begin with and how they've actually coped with the adversity so far and any other adversity that they, they have gone through in their past, including their childhood. Next slide, please. So in terms of psychotherapy considerations and mapping out a treatment uh, plan, um, I would summarise the key uh, features and how they fit in. So in terms of um, uh, Melissa's symptomatology, we know that the symptoms have been activated by a stress response. Um, we also know from the evidence uh, um, from the literature, including some very uh, well controlled studies in Australia and longitudinal studies that unresolved adjustment disorders can actually evolve and morph into more chronic psychopathology, including chronic major depression with concurrent other types of anxiety and substance abuse problems. So um, we know that it would be helpful to nip it in the bud early um, and, and provide uh, options for such clients. Um, Melissa's also um, displaying um, the tripartite features of um, mental health problems, including um, a behavioural response. What I mean by that, she's eliciting withdrawal avoidance behaviour from social connections. Um, she's feeling isolated and that is a uh, primary concern which needs to be addressed in therapy. She's got a physiological reactivity impacting on her sleep and there's fatigue both mentally and physically. And her cognitive attributions are evident even at the initial assessment. She's got guilt. Um, including about her parenting, the impact it has on her teen, uh, teenage children, as well as her own self-worth. So in drawing on the evidence-based practice, the evidence for treat, psychotherapy treatments for adjustment disorder are in their infancy, and this can be modified for adjustment disorder, but we also know for major depressive disorder, I would be recommending on the basis of the current evidence uh, a behavioural activation therapy plan and integrating some cognitive therapy there because of the cognitive attributions. In particular, I'd be working with, the, um, with Melissa in terms of a value-based, um, her values, uh, what she values to return to in terms of activities, um, to return uh, gradually to her normal life while accepting uh, the losses that she's endured with her relationships um, and, and her uh, previous partner. The treatment would incorporate uh, looking at her self-attributions, her outlook in life, because we also know a risk for chronic depression is negative outlook in life and not having any uh, plans in the short term and particularly in the longer term. And as I mentioned earlier, um, I'd also uh, make sure uh, bringing in um, the client's strengths into the treatment plan and using that as a motivational tool, tool and highlighting the strengths at the end of the initial assessment to the client because most clients who are depressed don't actually see how strong they are even in a crisis point. So thank you. I think that brings me to the end of the slides. Thanks, Maria. And uh, now I'd like to welcome Curtis to respond from your perspective as a psychiatrist. Thanks very much, um, Mary. And uh, can I say thank you to Monica and Maria for really doing my job. Um, in respect of this, um, I would endorse everything 
that Monica and uh, Maria have said. Um, the approaches are, from my point of view, absolutely bang on. And a part of me thinks that if I was a psychiatrist receiving the referral from, um, uh, well, Monica, but if Maria was involved as well, uh, there is really not that much more for me to do other than um, look at the history in the way that um, both Monica and Maria were uh, outlining and then clarifying whether or not uh, our to bring though was um, maybe looking at this whole issue of adjustment disorder from a slightly different perspective. Um, Firstly, uh, look, at, look to the right of the slide. That's a very good book, I believe, around the uh, concept of sort of medicalizing and psychiatricizing normal human experience, in this case, sadness. And I believe that's something we need to bear in mind. And uh, in fact, it was Mary's first question to me tonight, and it was a very, very good one. How do we distinguish the normality? Um, and of course, Melissa is in a very difficult situation. It's not just the marital breakdown. Um, she's now facing some workplace challenges. She's got uh, a lot of challenges with her friendship group. Um, and so it's, her sort of difficulties are sitting in the sort of minestrone and a very unpleasant, un, untasty minestrone of life for her. And it's not surprising that she would be struggling. On the other hand, we know that she's symptomatic. So looking to the left of this slide, thinking about, in this case, depression as what I would call a construct, asking the question, when, when is it an illness and when might it be worthy of treatment? And I think one way to look at that is to think of it as a spectrum. So um, either from top to bottom or left to right, you can imagine the spectrum uh, starting with obviously reactive types of depression, a uh, depressive reaction to something terrible that's happened. Indeed, that's Melissa's situation. And then right over at the other end of the spectrum is what we used to call endogenous or probably now would call melancholic depression, um, which is characterized by, uh, so PMR means psychomotor retardation, which means slowing up of physical, and mental uh, faculties and very depressive thinking, guilt, uh, pessimism, self-criticism, maybe even suicidality. And we have a little bit of that going on in Melissa's case. And in elderly patients, a lot of agitation, sometimes in the younger patients, but often in elderly patients. And then in the middle, we would have a mix of reactive to stressors plus maybe some personality vulnerabilities and sort of in the past we we would have called that neurotic depression next slide please so maria's already uh, put up the diagnostic criteria for adjustment disorder um, this is a sort of a reinforcement of that and just a reminder of how do you tell the difference uh, between sort of normality and adjustment disorder in fact, Maria also made the point about the significance of function and functional impairment and a lot of symptoms in major depressive disorder. But in adjustment disorder, as I mentioned earlier, we look at distress that's in excess of what you'd expect from exposure to the stressor or this notion of impairment. And it doesn't have to be severe impairment, but in Melissa's case, she's really you know, missing out. She's withdrawn from a lot of things. And so we certainly argue that she is to some extent impaired, not impaired in the sort of totally impaired uh, notion, but at least partly impaired. Next slide, please. So if I was seeing Melissa, I'd be thinking um, about what type of depression is this lady suffering? Is it really an adjustment disorder or is it um, more of a melancholic? And as um, I think Maria mentioned, sometimes adjustment disorder or adjustment reactions can evolve over time, just as things like skin cancer and various other medical conditions can evolve over time. So adjustment disorder can evolve into a more severe type of depression, usually major depressive disorder. 
But on the left of our slide, what, what I've tried to capture there, and this is taken from the Black Dog in, uh, Institute, which is a significant reference I would recommend to everybody, is the sort of um, uh, trying to capture the percentage of patients that come through all of our doors typically with what type of depression are they suffering being the question. And you can see the tiny little circle of psychotic depression. I would see much more of that than say most of you guys, I think as a psychiatrist, because there's a referral sort of bias. And then maybe between two and 10% of all of the depression out there in the community might be melancholic. These days we would call that major depression with melancholia, a descriptor. And then the rest is non-melancholic and that's where the adjustment disorders would sit. So just on statistics alone, probably most of the depression in the community is not the major depressive disorder type. It's much more reactive, but we still need to look for that. The, we look, still need to look for major depressive disorder. What do we look for? So on the right, that's a screening instrument. Again, from the Black Dog Institute, that is helpful to identify those patients that might have more of a melancholic type of depression, those who are sort of slowed up both physically and mentally. And that brings me to the value of being able to do a mental state examination. So with our materials with Melissa, we only have the history. And from my point of view, I would want to be able to sit down with Melissa and really observe her over a lengthy interview and be able to do a mental state examination, identifying whether or not in fact she does have any of these slowed up psychomotor retardation type features. That instrument there, by the way, is not the type of instrument that Maria was talking about, which is a, she was talking about typical and really helpful screening instruments in clinical practice. This one would help more to distinguish on the basis of your observations whether or not somebody might have melancholia. And the significance of that is we would just use more medications than psychotherapy. Next slide, please. This here is also from the Black Dog Institute. And I just wanted to put it out there for you because I think it's a very, very useful model. I think um, Monica actually touched on a lot of these factors in her presentation about trying to sort of um, identify them and then in the, uh, as a psychiatrist, what we try to come to is what's called a formulation, which is really an understanding of uh, an answer to the question, why has this particular person presented in this particular way at this particular time? And um, invariably, when we're looking at um, the impact of stressors uh, in the context of a depressive state, it'll come back to that thing in the middle, the meaning of the events. And obviously for Melissa, very, very meaningful stressors have occurred. Next slide, please. Just a comment about the course over time of adjustment disorder. Um, just look at the black line first. And you, you, you know, you might think, well, if a stressor occurs, people are going to be feeling sort of bad initially. And then over time, it's going to settle down in this nice curvy linear way. Actually, the reality is more like the green line. Things tend to go up and down. And of course, in Melissa's case, we wouldn't be surprised by that because there's a whole bunch of other stresses starting to pile up for her and difficulties as time goes by. So just because someone's really bad at week three and is a lot or maybe somewhat better at week six doesn't mean in week eight they're going to be better. They might be a bit worse, but hopefully by that maybe week 12, 16 and so on, the general trend is one of improvement with the types of treatments that Maria was talking about. Next slide, please. This is my last slide. Um, just draw your attention to the image on the right first. That is my uh, understanding, and I think most people's understanding of optimal patient care. It's really a shared decision-making uh, process um, between therapist, uh, you know, doctor, psychologist, mental health social worker, whatever the profession is, and, and the patient. And that will draw on in 
clinical practice, evidence, the evidence base. So from my point of view as a medical practitioner, evidence-based medicine. On the left, what is the evidence base with respect to adjustment disorder? Well, I think as uh, Maria mentioned, it's in its infancy, um, but there are three approaches that are potentially going to be helpful. One is modifying or removing the stressor. Uh, the second is facilitating adaptation or adjustment to the stressor using various psychological therapies. And the third one is altering the symptomatic response. So the depressed mood, the sleep disturbance, particularly in this case, um, with perhaps behavioural or psychotherapeutic approaches, but also, at least for me, because I can prescribe consideration of medication, I would have to say, in most cases of adjustment disorder, I would be trying to avoid the use of medication. Um, but there are some cases that are more severe or where there might be target symptoms that will be very effectively addressed. Um, and insomnia might be one of those in the short term, although just a plug that cognitive behaviour therapy for insomnia is the gold standard. The natural history of adjustment disorder I've mentioned before, it can morph or evolve into a major depressive disorder, but sometimes it'll evolve if it's more of an anxiety-based type of condition uh, into something like a generalised anxiety disorder. Thank you. Thanks to all of you and we're going to begin our panel discussion very shortly. Um, so just a reminder to the audience that you can change your slide and video layout if you want to look at the videos more now than that slide which is going to sit there for a while by clicking on the icon with the two arrows inside a circle on the top right corner of the slide window. Um, and we, I'm going to start with a question first of all that's just around um, diagnostic clarification. So I think Maria, I'm going to ask you this one. So um, a um, participant um, called Shay in the audience has asked us a question. If clients, just to clarify whether if the client meets the criteria for major depressive disorder, then does that mean they don't meet the criteria for adjustment? And it when you had the comparison side by side, it did look like she met criteria for both in a way. Yeah. So Maria, could yeah. you just expand on that? Yes, thanks for that and, and seeking that clarification. Yes, so why I had it side by side is because I had it in red font when I was comparing it and, and the purple font was what I thought Melissa's case had met. And that's the criterion C line for both. So. If um, a disorder is, um, if the stressor symptoms are better accounted for another uh, psychological or psychiatric disorder in the DSM, then that disorder overrides adjustment disorder. So to answer that, the, uh, Shay's question, that is correct. As long, as, uh, but you can get a comorbid diagnosis if there is a history of depression um, or another disorder for Melissa and then the stressor has set off another constellation of symptoms. So say, for example, Melissa has a history of generalised anxiety disorder. The stressor then sets off these mood symptoms, um, but they don't fully meet uh, major depression. Then she could have GAD history with uh, concurrent active adjustment disorder. But the way that this case has been presented, I would be inclined to say Melissa meets major depressive disorder as a result of the stressor onset from the info we have. Therefore, she does not meet adjustment disorder because of the ruling out criterion C of adjustment disorder of DSM-5. I am going to ask, we'll, we'll come back to these questions around um, diagnosis, but um, Monica, I was wondering, so a couple of people have asked really, this is such a sensible question. Did GPs diagnose adjustment disorder to prevent depression from marring a patient's employment record? And also a similar kind of question, what, what difference does it make for work cover if you're putting adjustment versus depression? So I might ask Monica first and I can see Maria's nodding. So we'll go to Monica and then Maria. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, and when I'm filling in the mental health treatment plan um, and talking to the person about why I'm choosing either or, um, essentially 
what I want is the advantage to them. So, um, you know, some people say, even though I've had previous episodes, um, you know, um, I really, it's always been in response to something. I'm naturally anxious. And so I think it's an adjustment disorder. And so it's really, um, you know, some people have said, when they clearly have a diagnosis of depression, when they tick all the boxes, when they respond brilliantly to the antidepressant that I've prescribed, and they still don't want to have a diagnosis of depression, then I, I guess I have to say, look, you know, in order to, I'm a, a stickler for the rules, and in order to honour both the treatment of this, but also, you know, everything else, I need to put the correct diagnosis down. I guess the thing about adjustment disorder is that um, it's really acknowledging that this person is struggling for lots of different reasons, and um, and that if you put depression, it, it's it's not so much that it. I don't know whether in this day and age where you can get treatment for depression where it really signifies so much in terms of, like it used to be insurance, um, that it used to have a great impact on your insurance and your ability to get a good premium. Um, but it's it's more about how is it, how are their employers going to respond in a way that is helpful? Because if it's an adjustment disorder, that's really a call out to the manager that this person perhaps hasn't had good boundaries and requires some support and that's up to the manager to do that um, so that you know as an employer they maintain their their duty to, of care to the um, to the employee so as a you know when I'm doing this in general practice I'm thinking of like what is actually when I'm talking to this person what's going to be helpful for them so that's how I choose it. And, and, you know, sometimes people don't want me to put down that they've got epilepsy on their medication history. Well, I have to. Uh, so it's the same with, with this. It's really what's going to be more accurate. Um, and in the long run, uh, not getting, not cause a problem for them. So that's really how I'm thinking about it. So I'll come to Maria's response in a second. And there is a comment from Joanne. Um, I think he's a social worker that that exclusion criteria. So because it, it this is a good example, actually. So Melissa actually meets criteria for major depression. So we have to say that. But in fact, um, is that something that we could critique about the DSM that in fact, it may be more helpful for her if we could say she had adjustment disorder. I, I don't really, before, it, I'm just, that's yeah, something that's come from the audience, yeah. Because I'm a GP, I can see people in a week's time and I might have a chat to her, having her grief acknowledged and her feelings acknowledged and yeah, it's awful. You know, sometimes just talking about things can improve the mood of a person and then it's not depression and so I'll be able to reassess it. Um, so that's one of the luxuries of being a GP that I can, it's an evolving picture and I've got a week to decide. I don't have to decide right there, right there. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good point. And Maria, did you want to respond to that distinction between the two as well? Yeah, just following on, I think, Monica, you've uh, wrapped that up uh, eloquently in a good segue because I think by the time I get the referral, it is set in and the GPs are more convinced that the individual does need psychotherapy and, and the depressive symptoms have set in. So uh, this is why I tend to have used adjustment disorder. It's really more with the anxiety related conditions. By the time I get to see them, I've rarely had an adjustment disorder with depressive specifier. It's more an acute episode of uh, major, depress major depression. But building on that question, I think our role, well, my role as a psychologist is in terms of enhancing mental health literacy in the community and part of that is uh, reducing the stigma around these disorders. We're getting caught up with semantics. So um, part of the psychoeducation is this is a better fit, um, but you're not alone. We know the statistics, there's a, you know, it's one of the most prevalent disorders in the community and it's going to be one of the dominant disorders by 2030. That's what the statistics is showing us. Um, one good thing about knowing about the symptomatology is that there is help out there. Um, it, and just because you've got an acute episode does not mean that you'll have a chronic history of it if um, you are motivated to, to sort of uh, change and also seek help and reach out for help even when you experience lapses. So I think just that honest upfront discussion um, and if the clients do feel bad about the, the labelling, then I think that is a definite valid point to address in uh, therapy before even moving on to a treatment plan. Thank you. Curtis, I'm going to ask you a question and this is a little bit coming back to um, your reference to the, the um, 
loss of sadness book, I guess, along the same theme. So there's a question from Joe. Um, so the, the criterion that says mark distress, that's in excess of what would be expected from from exposure to the stressor. So her comment is that isn't isn't this really a value judgment about what would be an expected response because this client is going through an extremely difficult situation and so is her response not proportional to the situation? So Curtis, did you, could you respond to that one? Um, it's a terrific question, Joe. Um, I think there's a lot of merit in, in the issue that you've raised. Um, the um, I don't know if it's a value judgment so much because we're not really making a value judgment about Melissa, but we are making a judgment about whether or not um, what we're, what she's describing and what we're seeing is sort of expectable. And I think in the case of Melissa, on the basis of what we've, um, on the basis of the information that we've had, um, I, I'm probably, um, it, you know, it's hard to be sort of binary in, in these types of situations, but if I had to be, I would probably be in the camp of saying, I think, you know, a lot of what she's describing and her difficulties are understandable and are reasonable in the circumstances. On the other hand, and this is why I think it's important to have a number of perspectives on a case at any one time, which is sort of a bit of a theme that we were just talking about, patient acceptability versus organisational requirements and so on. Um, I would be thinking from the perspective of what is this lady suffering? I think it is a major depressive disorder. Um, she does have five of the nine criteria that are required and her, you know, her struggle is quite significant. She's only just hanging in there at work. Um, she's really not having much of a social life anymore. And there's that guilt stuff. And there's that, you know, have I, you know, have I sort of, have I been a bad wife type thing? Um, and I think they're all pointers to really looking at this case as major depressive disorder. So I think what you've said is probably right, but I also think in this case, it may be a bit of a red herring in that Melissa's probably developed a major depressive disorder. I'll say one other thing about major depressive disorder though. It is a five of nine criteria and anybody who wants to hark back to mathematics, maybe, I don't know, grade eight, how many ways can you configure nine objects into groups of five? The answer is a more than 1,500. What that means is you can get major depressive disorder in more than 1,500 ways, which is which makes it a bit of a problematic entity. We could talk about that until the cows come home, but that's why it would be important to see Melissa and have that mental state examination and be able to sort of get that feel for just how reactive is her affect, for example, when you're talking to her? How shakeable are these ideas of being, you know, having done something to make her husband have an affair, you know, the guilt stuff? Because if that stuff was sort of relatively unshakable and she's very flat without reactivity, I'm definitely saying she's got a major depressive disorder and the whole notion of adjustment disorder becomes irrelevant because at the end of the day, the DSM allows what is hierarchical and it allows major depression to basically trump adjustment disorder. So um, I think someone called Sumitra in the chat box has also commented, I, th I think what you're all saying really is that you, you're probably going to start with biological and psychosocial treatments um, if, that's, if that's what is needed. So it's not necessarily an, an and either or, it's probably both. And um, now I, there was a really good question. So, so there's been a lot of both in the registration questions and um, in during the webinar around grief and a, and you know a, adjustment to loss. So I wonder if anyone would like any of you would like to comment um, a little bit more because I mean there is a big loss here. Um, there's a number of losses actually, and so again I guess 
how much of this is a normal grief process. And indeed, um, someone's commented about a history of trauma and loss and perhaps unacknowledged grief or unprocessed grief, even from past things or trauma from the past. Um, how do we keep that in mind when we're seeing someone now? I know that's an extremely broad question. It's really for discussion rather than an answer. Who wants to say something? <laughs> Can I just Curtis? start with yeah. a brief comment because I'd like to hear Maria and Monica more on this one. But but I think that's right. In the Melissa case, I think there is a place for both biological and psychological therapy. Clearly, the psychological therapy is going to be looking at loss and adjustment. The biological therapy has to address, I think, in her case, the insomnia. By the way, we didn't get any history I think about alcohol or drugs I'm going to presume that it's probably not a factor I think both Monica and Maria mentioned it but um, let's presume that our Melissa is not drinking so it would be good to have her sleeping better because then she's able to going to be able to do her psychotherapy better um, if she's not sleep deprived and you know struggling with insomnia um, uh, yeah that's probably where I'd stop I could go on, but I won't. Okay. Um, Maria, perhaps your comment about the grief kind of questions? Um, I, I agree with this questioning. There is a lot of loss for Melissa and it's, and, and hence, uh, dare I say the term, there is the adjustment to loss. Um, there's, uh, yeah, the grieving of the loss of the marital relationship, the family network, the social network, and it's going to be and the neighbourhood network. Um, and as you can see, this is a slippery slope because if she's not continuing to perform, this could put pressure on her work. We don't know how she's getting on with her colleagues. Um, so as Curtis even raised, the loss issues is something that would be addressed in psychotherapy um, and particularly when um, both from the behavioural perspective of getting her to assess her values and how she wants to live her life moving forward um, and when it comes to the cognitive elements of the therapy, it's to do with her attributions um, in terms of her own self-worth um, and putting them into perspective of what she's gone through. So in the first instance, when, when working with uh, uh, people with um, eliciting signs of depression, um, it is about acknowledging um, and making space for that loss, but also then how can you then pick up the pieces and move forward? And that's where we need to build on the client's strengths as well. In terms of the other related question that was asked about past loss, that's important because that's, that would give me a good indicator of what natural resiliency skills clients are coming to psychotherapy with. How have they overcome previous adversity? And have they actually given themselves credit for that? Um, if they've got unresolved trauma and loss, I think um, such a uh, key stressor of a marital breakdown can reactivate old wounds and um, um, resurrect old grief, and it can then overlap with the current grief, and that has to probably be addressed in therapy, which I would do sequentially initially, and, 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 it, and it's easier said than done, but there is going to be overlaps as well. Um, but both would have to be addressed at some point through the psychotherapy plan. Monica, did you want to add anything to those comments? Just from my perspective, and I, you know, it's almost all being said, but just from my perspective, the idea of it's not so much what happens to us because we're, we have grief and loss all the time. Um, you know, it's just stages of life, these transitions that we go through. It's more about whether we have the resources to cope with it, whether we have the inner resources and the outer resources. Uh, and that's really what we're trying to help Melissa with, um, to, to connect to her own strength, to connect to her resources and those ones outside. And perhaps to develop, you know, to be, to be one of those resources as a GP, but then to develop any of the other ways that she can help herself. And grief is a process. It's not a, you know, you can't just get through it just because you know what you're grieving about and you know what you've got to do. Okay, well, it's over. It's like you've still got to go through it. And just normalising that, that that's okay. And we, yeah, it's crappy. 
I think we are, um, we've mostly addressed the questions from the chat box tonight, but there's a really interesting one that's just come in from Elisa around how you might factor the patient's sense of self into the treatment. Because I guess these disruptions that have just happened are, are the kinds of things that might shake your view of yourself. Um, perhaps Curtis, do you want to respond to that? Well, I've got a couple of thoughts about that. It, again, a great question because um, um, I think uh, to, to try to answer it briefly, if, it were, if there's a case of adjustment disorder, um, by and large, it's probably going to be easier to, to incorporate that into the psychological therapy in the way that Maria and Monica were talking about, looking at values and basically the sort of you know, bloated the sense of self that the person would have had in a situation like Melissa's. In the case of a major depressive disorder, they can be mild, moderate, severe, sometimes psychotic, as I mentioned before. Just a, a quick point, the more severe cases might, you may observe a sort of a self-denigration and a self-criticism because of the illness itself. And that's potentially a biological thing. So just be mindful of that because that's probably not going to respond to psychotherapy and may just resolve without psychotherapy with robust medication treatment in the much more severe cases. But um, it is a bit of a, it's a tricky one sometimes because people will end up sometimes having very negative self-concepts in the throes of a more severe depression and that won't respond to psychotherapy. But I'd be interesting to see what Maria and Monica would say too. Perhaps Monica, you're nodding, so I'll go to you next. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm nodding because it's it's true that in severe depression, people are just so, you know, it sucks the air out of the room. Um, but I, I think, you know, one of the things as a GP that sometimes we get people and we think, is it adjustment disorder? Is it depression? And sometimes you really have to factor in has this person ever coped well with other things in their lives? Do, do they have, you know, are they on, on the sliding scale of someone with a personality disorder? Like, do they have some personality disorder traits or a full-blown personality disorder? Sometimes we're only, you know, having that concept of, you know, how much can we improve um, the, the life of someone by working with them rather than thinking that we're going to get them to some sort of imaginary wonderful level that both they and, and we want for them. And this idea of the sense of self is just being curious and asking them questions about, um, you know, what would you say to someone who was your friend about what's just happened and what sort of a person they are? What would you say to your children if this had happened to them? And that can sometimes give them the perspective and help them to, to see themselves as going through grief and going through a very difficult situation. and you know, there before the grace of God go I kind of thing, um, rather than being extra hard on themselves. Um, so that's a, a perspective that I've also got, yeah. Um, Maria, did you want to add something? Yeah, I'd just like to echo what Curtis and uh, Monica has said. I do think that uh, with depressed cases, and I think it can be a, across the continuum and can fluctuate, the self-deprecating and uh, self-denigrating schemas do arise um, and I'm very mindful of that um, and that's why I did recommend even uh, with Melissa's case to consider integrating it with cognitive therapy because there are already signs that that could go down that that path so the sense of self is really important for any client irrespective of disorder to make to check in with that and to actually address it with depression it's particularly important and even with adjustment with significant stresses um, and as uh, Monica has said, um, perspective taking is a very vital um, and powerful, I think, therapeutic tool. Um, and, and it sounds like um, GPs are obviously doing it, but in psychotherapy, we definitely do it even through the uh, different um, components of uh, cognitive types of therapy. Um, so getting, um, and, and in my experience with depressed clients, they're very good at, at giving advice about uh, to close friends and colleagues. And then when you ask them, but why can't you also take on board the same advice for yourself? 
that's where the plot thickens in psychotherapy because it, I call it then, then you get the yes buts or I call it the but eyes in questions and then that's a significant component of therapy. Why are they making special rules for themselves? So we are then tackling uh, core sense of self issues with the client and, and I'm uh, grateful to hear uh, Curtis's comments about then the need probably to work in tandem with psychiatrists and or GPs for the um, pharmacotherapy arm of treatment as well. So we, we are approaching the end and I'm really conscious that we have not been able to answer everybody's questions but there was one more which I think Curtis you can um, just answer quickly um, before we start summing up. So someone has pointed out that, and I, you did as well, that there's mild, moderate and severe depressive disorders and that medication is not the first line treat for, for mild to moderate depressive disorder. So you were specifically talking about people with a significant, you know, severe range or melancholic depression would be needing biological treatment as in medication first up. And in fact, the biological treatment you thought would be appropriate for Melissa Woods around sleep. So just yeah. to confirm, yeah, the antidepressants right. don't have the evidence in mild to moderate. Yeah, the, there's, there's a lot of evidence for a lot of other things. And I think um, well-conducted psychotherapy and a good treatment relationship is is just gold, really, for the milder to moderate ones. Um, the more severe ones, yes, the biological treatment. But it doesn't mean that at some point in their recovery, psychotherapy is irrelevant. I think the evidence is very clear actually that for major depressive disorder the best outcomes come from a combination of antidepressant medication and some form of psychological therapy tailored to the patient. Thank you Curtis. Um, so we're just coming to your final wrap up so I'm just going to go around the three of you and ask for a um, a final message that you'd like to leave the audience with or a reflection from the discussion. Um, I think we'll go in the order that we started with. So Monica, I might go to you first. Mm. Any final thoughts? Yeah, uh, well, I've learnt a lot tonight, so thank you. Um, but one thing that I think as a GP, when I'm working with someone and, and I guess, you know, from years of general practice is this idea of the yes but person and they can give advice to someone else and not so much to themselves. And, you know, there are about half of the population who find it very difficult to meet outer expectations. And so in the resources, I've put a link to a writer called Gretchen Rubin and her quiz, where she actually talks about strategies um, to actually help people who find it very difficult to meet their own inner expectations like of self-care, doing exercise, going to sleep on time, doing meditation if they so choose. And that, you know, when we help our patients know themselves better, that we can actually, that's actually connecting them to their resources as well. So as a GP, we can be a support for them, but we can actually, actually help them to get to know themselves better. Um, so that's all I think for tonight. Thanks, Monica. Maria? I think I'd probably re reiterate a couple of points that I mentioned earlier. I, I think we need uh, informed consent from our clients um, and to, to get that I think we need to provide a really good educational um, summary as to uh, you know what, what are the constellation of symptoms they're experiencing. It's just a label to guide our treatment, hence why I use that GPS navigator. And then even if they don't want, whether it's biological or psychotherapy options, and even as Monica said, there's lifestyle um, options available and growing evidence base for that. So I'm well aware and I do collaborate with exercise scientists as well. So for some clients, it's just even changing lifestyle and a wait and watch uh, component. But from a psychotherapy perspective, I think my role is also to facilitate even clients in terms of a further uh, destigmatizing mental health. Um, even though they've asked for help, they, they could still be conflicted. Thanks. And Curtis? Okay, so um, not to um, sort of overlap on what um, Monica and Maria have said, but just a couple of things. My reference um, is the Black Dog Institute. It's got a fantastic website, both for professionals and for lay people, members of the general community. It's great for therapists. And, and patients as well um, in respect of the topic of depression. Um, and um, I suppose I would uh, just encourage people to 
um, be on the lookout for the more severe melancholic types of depression because they're the ones that are probably going to need um, you know robust medication before the therapy but therapy along the way the rest are probably going to be well managed by very competent non-psychiatrist I'm talking from the perspective of a psychiatrist very competent non-psychiatrist professionals with well-conducted therapy Maria hinted at schema therapy which is terrific um, cognitive behavior therapy there's a couple of other types um, and so um, where would you where would you find that evidence of melancholia you might get it in the history but look for it in the mental state examination in your observation and my last tip develop the collaborative networks it's you know it's just fantastic to be able to work as a team and uh, you know, Maria was talking about it I know Monica does as well um, but you know most of us have got our favorite psychologists and our you know GPs who will refer to us maybe even exercise physiologists these days dietitians if there's eating disorder issues um, it's just terrific so yeah do develop those collaborative networks thank you all very much and I just someone was very pleased Curtis when you mentioned mental health social workers and I do just want yeah. to acknowledge that there are a number of different professions who do do psychotherapy really well yeah. and the MHPN is um, was set up to support the practitioners who are working under Medicare um, to collaborate with each other and I also recognise that there will be other people in the audience who, who don't come from that background um, who are still doing really important work with people. So I just wanted to finish on the note that it's um, that collaboration point from Curtis is fantastic and um, there are many, many people who can be helpful to people. So thank you all so much for your contributions tonight and a really interesting discussion. And uh, I'd really like to encourage the audience. Thank you all for your participation and your questions. And I hope you've had good chats in the chat box, which I can't see other than the questions. So please make sure you complete the exit survey before you log out. So you can click the pie chart icon in the lower right corner of your screen, or you can wait for a message to pop up. But please give us feedback. It does inform future webinars and you will receive a statement of attendance within four weeks. And you will also be sent a link to the resources from the webinar. And I would like to thank all of our participants for providing such great resources tonight. This has been a really rich one in terms of resources. Um, just to let you know about MHPN Presents, so this is um, the, the podcast arm uh, and the series is Transitions and Monica co-hosts a number of the podcasts. So there's five new episodes on the series um, that have been re released and um, the final one will be available on the 30th of June and you can find that by going to the website um, or search for MHPN Presents wherever you like to get your podcasts. Now, would you like to continue this discussion with um, local practitioners or perhaps start discussing issues of relevance in your local areas? MHPN has project officers who can help you establish and support interdisciplinary mental health networks across Australia metropolitan, regional, rural and remote and some networks are online so we can um, include remote people as well and there are currently 373 networks around the country so if you'd like to join one or start one please contact MHPN and I would uh, before we go I do want to acknowledge uh, people who have lived experience of mental illness and also their um, family and carers who've lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to do so in the present and I thank everyone, the panellists and the audience very much for your participation this evening and we look forward to seeing you at another MHPN event. Good night.